This podcast does not provide medical advice. Please listen to the complete disclosure at the end of the recording. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Everyone Dies, the podcast where we talk about serious illness, dying, death, and bereavement. I'm Marianne Matzo, a nurse practitioner, and I use my 43 years of nursing experience to help you understand what happens at the end of life. And I'm Charlie Navarrete, an actor in New York City, here to ask the questions that you may have while listening to our broadcast. We are both here because we believe that the more you know, the better prepared you will be to make difficult decisions. Please relax and get yourself a beverage, something to eat, maybe a nice grilled cheese sandwich. Mm, And thank you for spending the next hour with Charlie and me. In the first half, we have a recipe of the week from Charlie. In the second and third half, we have an interview with Anita Myers, author of the book, Hearts Do Matter. Hey, Charlie, I saw a film last night. I think you might like it. Or maybe you probably already saw it. It's called The Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society. Have you seen that? No, I don't know how I missed that. Uh, Is it it a new film or or what? Um, I think it was released in the general world, but I saw it on um, Netflix. And actually, I ordered the book, too. It's from a novel, and um, I'm, I'll put the the link to purchase it on Amazon in our show notes. But it was it's a story of sort of starts in like 1940 through, I guess, 46 on the island of Guernsey. Yeah. And the reason I was interested in it is that, you know, when we look at our podcast, we can see where people are listening. And I, I said to David, oh, there's somebody in Guernsey listening to our show. And I had to really? look up where Guernsey was because I didn't know where it was. And then I saw this thing on, on um, Netflix, Netflix for yeah. the, the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Society. And um, it was it was a good film. I, I mean, I, I don't know if if. You'll like it, but I thought it was a good film, and you know I love love history stuff, so there was that. Huh. So I want to tell you about it. Check it out. I will. Thank you. And yeah. w- and with that, our uh, dish for the day, for the week, for this podcast, whatever. I is, thought I was the mm-hmm. dish of the day. Maybe you're always the dish of the day. Yes, yes. sir. The second dish of the day is potato peel <laughs> pie. <laughs> And it's not even a close second to you. Aww. There we are. Yes. Now, this was just one creation made from necessity when food was rationed during World War II. As soon as the German army invaded Guernsey in 1940, the island was cut off from all communication with the mainland. With food restricted to the point of much of the population starving and cuts in electricity so that candles were the norm, These restrictions and curfews ensured that no one went out after dark. During the German occupation, food was scarce. Most farm animals were confiscated from the farmers, and people relied on the crops they grew, like potatoes. And, you know, in the film, they were Uh saying they they confiscated the the animals so that they could feed the um, German soldiers. Right, yeah. So, bastards. So... Traditional Guernsey potato peel pie was made of three ingredients, potatoes, beetroot, and milk. With oh, little, well, and, and, but also remember, there was, you know, very little flour or butter available to the islanders during German occupation. So the potato peelings were used to create an open pie crust of sorts into which mashed potato and chopped beetroot was added and then baked in the oven. Now, I've never made a potato concoction I didn't like. And while I'm no Martha Stewart, you know, despite what everyone says, even <laughs> – okay, no one says that. Not even Miss Stewart. Who, who is, 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 is a big um, fan of martinis? I, I, really? Oh, oh, please. I've seen a couple of her uh, shows, especially the ones with uh, Snoop Dogg. There's Martha kicking back those martinis. Huh. Yes. Maybe I'm, we should start drinking martinis when we do our show. I'm drinking again. Um, fine. 
<laughs> that was an easy sell. <laughs> ow, ow, stop twisting my arm. Gosh darn it. Ow, 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 ow. Okay, fine. I'll have a martini. Two at the very most. Three, I'm under the table. Four, I'm under my host. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy Parker. So going back to Miss Stewart and Dorothy Parker, um, yeah, so so with that, you know, just with the, the, the limited amount of uh, ingredients available, um, well, and so basically you needed copious amounts of salt and sugar, um, otherwise the dish was going to be bland. The original dish was not particularly pleasing to the palate, yeah, no kidding. And many cooks have adjusted this recipe since the war ended, but still using the original ingredients as the foundation. The crust and topping are crunchy, which is a nice contrast to the soft potato filling. Mm. Yes. Well, okay. All right, there we maybe, are. May, maybe, the, maybe the film is probably better than the, the pie, but... Those of you who make it, just send us a note and let us know how it is. You know, and, and with that, you know, going now to our, uh, to our original, you know, origins when we, when we started the podcast about martinis, let us please, Remato, Remato, let us please, <laughs> <laughs> you know, really, I haven't had a drop, but just the thought of uh, sipping martinis. <laughs> ah, yes. Oh, um, now, this is potato. Now, my favorite martini, of course, is gin for all of these, all of you, um, you know, keeping score. But Marianne, where does vodka come from? Potatoes. There we are. We have a theme here. Shaken, not stirred. And don't get me started about yeah. shaken, not stirred. Oh God. Well, okay, We've since you've been you, down that road before. Since you asked, well, okay, I guess we have. So with that in mind, please go to our webpage. Or I'm gonna keep talking about martinis. So go to our webpage for a link, not only for the recipe you know, about, about the pie, not about martinis, not only for the recipe, but additional resources for this program. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram, and remember to rate and review this podcast. As a nonprofit organization, we depend on you, gentle listeners, and always appreciate your donations. Please go to our webpage to donate in support of our work. www.everyonedies.org. That's every... The number one dies dot org. Marianne. Thanks, Charlie. So we are really lucky this week. We have an interview with Miss Anita Myers, who is an emotional intelligence strategist and the founder of Interscope 365 LLC. She provides specialized training programs designed to improve the inner landscape and blueprint of emotional power. Her work is dedicated to redefining wellness through the engagement of emotional intelligence. She is an online social media personality and focuses on the powers we have to live better with the powerful resources we have within our grasp. She is also a published author of several books, including Hearts Do Matter, Grateful Celebrations, and The Undercover Superhero. I hope you enjoy our interview with Anita Myers. So today I am going to be talking with Anita Myers, and Anita has written a few books, and we're going to talk about her most recent one today, um, and she is what she calls an emotional intelligence strategist, um, helps people to identify emotions, manage them, and educate through strategy. So she's a certified life coaching and life coach and relationship coach. So Anita, welcome to Everyone Dies. Hey, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, I'm pleased to get to ch to chat with you. So there's a lot to unpack in the life coaching, relationship coach. We could probably yeah. maybe have you back just even to talk a little bit more about that. But let's today start with your book um, that, that you wrote. It's called Hearts Do Matter. Um, it's a paperback, and it's a hardcover, and you can order it from Amazon. And you can look on the blog, and you'll be able to see, uh, you know, links and stuff for how to find it. And there's a companion guide called Grateful Celebrations, a gratitude journal. 
So first off, I need to tell us about Hearts Do Matter. Well, Hearts Do Matter was a book that literally, um, it, you know, sometimes people plan what they're going to say, and, and it's a big to do in terms of writing a book. And this one wasn't that way. This didn't show up that way. This is actually a second book that showed up kind of in my mind, and, I, and it, was through, it was through one drive where I had put together this poem. And, it, and really, this book is an illustrated book that I designed for all ages, even though you will look at it and think it's a children's book, which it can be. I just wanted it to be kind of like a Dr. Seuss's feel where a child could read it, but an adult could totally get it. And mm-hmm. um, I had put together this poem that was in tribute to my mother who actually passed away in 2005. And it was one of those things that I had gone through in my life where my relationship with her was very strong. We had a really, really good relationship with each other. And losing her was really one of the toughest things I've gone through. And I know so many people, they, they have those moments. People can relate to me that there's someone in their life that meant so much to them and then now they're not there anymore. And with my relationship with my mom, one of the things when, when I got the news that she had passed, Uh, I was obviously in a very devastated state of mind. And one of the things I had said was, is there any way you can tell me, I I was talking obviously to my mom who wasn't here anymore. She was in another country actually when she passed. And one of the things I had said, I'm here in Chicago um, and my mom was uh, in India and I'm I'm of Indian descent. I was born and raised in Chicago and my parents are both Indian. They immigrated here. And so now they had moved back and she was ill and eventually she passed. And I had, I said to my mom, if there's any way that you can tell me that you're okay, you know, just, I know we all have those moments. They they become very emotional moments and you hope that you can get a sign of something. And Mm -hmm. there was a moment for me where the human side of me was like, Myth busting it, but the the spiritual side of me had said, "This is it. This is what it is." And it was where th- there was a, a clock that was on top of a television. It had a wand on it that went back and forth. You know those kinds of mm-hmm. clocks that tells you messages like it's Thursday, happy birthday, whatever it is. <laughs> so this one was a message where I knew the order of it because I've had it for so long. But it went out of order and it went into "I love you," which was supposed to that was like a that wasn't even part of what I had designed for what to happen. And when that showed up, uh, that was like an ethereal moment for me. It really shocked me. But again, I myth busted it. I said, I probably said something wrong. But I saw the heart there. I, that's what I saw. It was it said, I heart you. And I saw the heart that showed up, and it, and it just stunned me. And, of course, I was very emotional. And um, some time would go by, and every time I thought about her, or I talked to her, or I prayed about her, or I felt sad about her, Somehow, in some incredible, fun, interesting, amazing way, I would see the image of a heart in something. And I'm not talking about man-made hearts. These are like the shadow of something casted and there's a heart. Uh, Mm. The drop of something showed up and it was in the form of a heart. And these things kept happening to me quietly. Like I didn't share it with anybody out loud at the time. It was happening to me in my own quiet moment. And I'd cry. Every time, I would just cry. I would grieve and I would cry was heavy and it was deep and as time would go by I always went to a dark place of missing her uh, which I think a lot of people can relate to where your heart Mm -hmm. just kind of has that dark spot in there if you will and well eventually with these hearts it started having me think differently it started having me look at the experience of life having her what a blessing I started looking at the experiences I had with her that I had absolute gratitude. Had she not been in my life, obviously I wouldn't be here, but more than that, the things that she said to me, the things that she shared with me, her personality. So I started looking at everything. And, you know, when I got to where I am today, this this year, we had COVID-19. We had everything that was going on in the way that it was. And I already had in my mind that I wanted to put this book together. And I had the illustrator in my mind of, who, you know, what I wanted to do. But it all seemed like it had to happen because this was a book that wasn't just for me. It was a book where I wanted to provide inspiration to people out there who have lost, and many have lost uh, mm-hmm. lives this year, and people still suffer now from losses of years ago, even like myself. But I wanted to redirect them from grieving to gratitude 
And that's how I got this book developed, where we're telling the story about love and the experiences when life was rich with my mother and where the love was and how love still exists even after life. And I felt that that was really important, that if we can, we can really show our attention to being grateful for having it more than looking at the lack of it, then I think that healing can begin. And so that's what I did. That sounds incredible. And it must have been um, healing for you to write it, I would think. You know, it was. Now, my mom passed in 2005, and she was ill with Alzheimer's prior to that. We learned in 1996 that she was diagnosed, and I think she even had it before. And my, my journey in learning the news, in dealing with the news, in experiencing the, the, the illness, all the way to, you know, getting the news of her passing, it was very hard for me. It was, it was incredibly hard for me. So much so that even with me being an emotional intelligence strategist that has a lot of the tools of how we need to handle ourselves, how we grieve and how we move forward and all that. And I've been pretty successful in a lot of these areas. Just writing the book had me in tears. Seeing mm-hmm. the illustrations brought me to tears. Finally reading it out loud, I still choke up. It's just one of those things that, you know, um, when, when it happens, um, I let myself have that moment. But I also look at those tears that tell me that I had something really amazing and I'm so glad that I have it. And um, I still see hearts today. And I, more than that, the number of people in my life, in my circle of friends and their friends and their friends and so on, um, I sound like a 70s commercial. If anyone hears this today, <laughs> they might remember what I'm talking about. <laughs> they told their friends and so on and so on. Um, but, you know, I've been getting such a collection of hearts uh, from people all over the United States and world that um, I knew that there was something very special in sharing this story first. And um, I do have a second uh, part of this that would be uh, not an illustration, but more of, uh, I'm going to call it a coffee table book, but it'll be revealing all the hearts that showed up from all the places in my life and people that have connected with me and what they've seen. Um, so yeah, it, it was a very, uh, emotionally releasing experience to let myself have these final, you know, um, grieving moments, but also celebrating moments. And that's also why I, um, I decided even in the middle of writing this illustrated book that I would also add in a gratitude journal that I called Grateful Celebrations intentionally. I wanted it to be more important to be grateful and to celebrate those you have had in your life that that loved you that you loved it's important to do that so that we can heal and they could still if you knew that love existed past life then the way you would approach life would be so much more enriched and i think everyone deserves to have that opportunity in their life so tell me a little bit more about that tell me more about what you mean by by that statement you just made you know i think that when we meet people um who've lost there are, there are those who somehow find ways to just keep moving forward, however they do it. Um, but the ones who, who still hold the, the, that hole in the heart type of feeling, mm-hmm. it keeps them from approaching new things. Sometimes, as an example, maybe um, somebody, someone who always had breakfast with their brother at this one location. It was their place. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes the feeling of loss might keep them from going back there because it's too hard, too hard Mm -hmm. to handle. It's too hard to, to, he's not here with me anymore is what they're focusing on. But when you have the sense of finding gratitude in the life that you had with them, you might actually go to that place and sit down and order the same thing that you would have with your brother. If he was there, what would he order? And you could actually enjoy that energy that you have with him And in my belief, I believe that he would actually find a way to say thank you for that moment because I think, well, we we know for a fact that energy doesn't die. Mm -hmm. Energy lives. And what we have in our system is energy that's uh, encased in our wonderful human body. So when energy is released, in a way, in some way, 
I've seen it happen with others. I know it's happened with myself. There's ways that thank yous can come through that they've acknowledged that you've done that. And, and you can still have those moments with them, even if they're physically not in front of you. So I like to see people view the loss more of where the gain was. You know, am I making sense with that? So it's like that, um, I forget who said it, maybe it was Shakespeare, it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all? Yes. I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful statement. And that whole loved, to have loved, we don't focus on that as much. We just focus on, I can't do this anymore. And mm-hmm. so while some of those parts are true, to know that you had it, what, to, to know what you gained from it is something to celebrate. So when people go through loss, so for instance, me, you know, I lost both my mother and my father. I'm an only child. So that's all I, I had. Um, I don't have the aunts and uncles that come around. I don't have cousins that come around. I don't have a family in that sense. It's just my parents. And so when you, when you live a life where you feel that you have lack you tend to not want to do more things. It it kind of domino effects. Obviously, Mm -hmm. when people go through grief, there's a sense of depression, which is completely normal. You, You go through depression. You feel the sadness. But then if you were to know that they were, that, that love does exist, after life. And I'll tell you, it's almost reminds me of, it still reminds me of, uh, the scene from ghost where Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore, again, going back in time, uh, Mm -hmm. there's a moment where she gets to see him. Mm -hmm. Remembered, this yeah. is uh, where he passes, and, and if anyone doesn't know this, you should definitely go see the movie. But, um, you know, when you get to see him moments before he has to return back to his maker, and there's this illumination where you get to see him, oh, it still chokes me just talking about it, Marianne. Honestly, mm-hmm. yeah. if yeah. all of us could have that moment, we would live well, so much better. But we are given the, the need to have faith that that happens. But what mm-hmm. I do notice is the illumination of, for me, hearth. For other people, I've heard fathers, I've heard the symbol of a number, you know, this is their, their track number that for sports, this is something, uh, the tulip, a certain flower, a certain bird, like you just name it. There's some connection that somebody has with someone that they care about, and in some way, wherever they are, they find a way to communicate that to you, even in, you know, a certain song plays, and you're like, oh, oh my God, I used to listen to that with my mom. So mm-hmm. even with me... When I had gone through my sense of depression, totally normal, all of us need to do it. And we have those days where I remember uh, she passed on August 15th. August 15th was a dark day for me. That's what I used to call it. I intentionally called it that. No one was going to talk to me. I wasn't going to do my business. I just want to go dark. And it felt Mm -hmm. like it was the right thing to do. And over time, I, I grew past that. And instead, on her birthday, on a Mother's Day, on um, even the, the day that she, what I call, became an angel before she transitioned. These are the days I celebrate and I honor and I respect. Because for me, in my mother's situation with her passing on that day, she happened to pass away on a day that's considered as uh, in India's Independence Day. And how beautiful oh. because of the circumstances that she was in, you know, especially having Alzheimer's, she was free. She was free. Mm-hmm. So I have, uh, for me, I created a tradition. I didn't really create it. It was a tradition between me and my mother. But on that day, um, one of the things that I used to do with my mom, I remembered so well, she always had, you know, because she's Indian, she had to have that English chai. So everyone talks about it with Starbucks now, but we, we did this before. And this, <laughs> this, this, <laughs> we own this one. So uh, we had this chai uh, with Salerno cookies. That's what we had. Ooh, she would have the Salerno cookies with me, with chai, and we would have it at lunch. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, after I came back home from school, it was us having tea time together. And it was just fun, just fun, putting it mm-hmm. around our finger. If anyone knows a Salerno cookie, go look it up. It's mm-hmm. adorable. Put it on your finger and just chew it and talk and eat and have a good time and sip that tea. So now in these certain specific times, I do that. This is my time mm-hmm. to have tea with my mom and celebrate her. And I don't look at it as the loss. I look at the gains. I look at what I can cherish and what I can be grateful for. That is a wonderful way of, of framing it and helping people to think about it. What do you say to people, your clients that you work with, who say, 
Well, I, I can honor them and I can remember them and I can be grateful for them. But, you know, I reach across the bed at night and it's cold and there's nobody there. Or I just want to smell her again. Or I just want a hug again. Or uh-huh. with their death, you know, our whole family has changed. And it's because she's not here. How do you frame that for people? You know, they're allowed to feel those feelings because that is what they're feeling. So first to be able to to identify that. Uh, I know oftentimes when we say these things to our loved ones, people that are surviving, uh, family members and friends mean so well when they say what they say, but sometimes the words hurt or the words keep us from feeling those feelings. So for instance, one of your examples is like, I just wish I could hug her. I mean, I can't tell you how much I'd like to say those things, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. But then having someone saying, well, you have to get over it. She's dead. It's okay. It happens. Um, That doesn't doesn't fulfill the heart. That doesn't fulfill the feeling of loss. That only solidifies that a death took place. But that, that the energy of that individual doesn't get the respect that it needs. So if somebody were to say to me, I wish I could hug her again, I would tell them that I know. I, I mean, I, 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 I totally understand that feeling. We all wish we could hug them again. But how can we hug them? What are ways that we can hug them in this situation? So let's just go with life for right now for a moment. If you were with your daughter, and your daughter and you are together, and everything is the way it is at home, and you have so much fun together, and now your daughter decides, oh, I'm going to go to college. And, you know, here, let's pretend that you're in Chicago. And your daughter's like, I'm going to go to college, and I'm going to go all the way to Hawaii to have college. And you say, <laughs> well, I want to support you, and I love you, and okay. So now she leaves to go to college, and the environment's different. That empty nest syndrome we all understand. I, I don't know if we all understand, but many of us know about it. <laughs> what do you do? And you know what? As mothers, we go through this from the very beginning when we have a child in our arms for like the longest time, it seems, and then they go to school for the first time and you have to let them go. That's the process that especially as parents, and I'm not, I'm not discounting uh, people that aren't parents, but we, we do go through so many different types of losses. May not, they may not be about loss of a life, but loss of a moment loss of those experiences. So how do you get by? What do you do? How do you handle those moments? When we deal with something as big as a loss of a life and you can't hug them again, there are still ways that you can. And what do I mean by that? Just changing our actions to doing something else. So for instance, it might not work for everybody right now, but I'm on this moment with you for a short period of time, so I'm going to give you (laughs) one. (laughs) But there's many others. Um, So for instance, uh, I have a backyard, and I'd love to hug my mom. And I yet can't hug her in that physical state. First of all, I should be able to say that to myself. I should be able to write that and cry. I should be able to you know, I could make a blanket with her her face on there or or her words on there or something. There's so many products now you can get. And maybe that blanket is going to be the thing that I could hold on to or a pillow is the thing I could hold on to that I have made or I make it myself or whatever the creative way and process. But let's just say I am through the need of the actual physical hug. What's another way that I could hug her? Um, Because I mentioned the backyard, my mom's um, I remember growing up with her, she loved peonies. She loved roses. She loved these types of flowers. So I create what I, I would call a memory garden. You can call it whatever you want. You can call it a name that your mom made up that's so funny. You could call it by the name of your mom's name. You could put something together that is, is something that's between you and her. And this way, and I'm just, again, I'm just giving an example of me and my mother, you just, when I create something like that, when I plant those new flowers in, and I do that in a ceremonial fashion, it becomes very sacred for me. It becomes enriched for me. And then I tend to it because I'm doing something that is passing like, you know, tradition. I'm doing something in, in honor of her. And that mm-hmm. helps me to put my feelings into something productive rather than, you know, um, contributing to something that's destructive. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? It absolutely does. I, um, my, my sister died when my 
daughters were in pre-K and kindergarten. So what is that, five and six or so? Uh And um, I said to them, I said, let's let's make, in that next summer, let's plant a vegetable garden for Aunt Joan. This will be Aunt Joan's um, vegetable garden. And my little one who was always, She's still very funny, but anyway, she just looked at me so seriously, and she said, well, when you die, don't they have any food? Why do we have to grow food for a child? Oh, oh, bless her heart. That is so darling. Oh, what did you say? Well, I said, well, you know, I, I don't really know, but we're doing this so that we can help remember Aunt Jeff. You know, oh, I like that. So, That's nice. So talked about it that way, but it just, it always would surprise me, like, the things that would come out of their mouth. And that's, you know, that's healing for us, too. You know, like, if you right. have children or whatever, you know, that, that work with you or, or, or honor you with, you know, the gardening project or um, anything of that type. And, you know, I... I often talked with people about when someone dies is to find an attribute that they have and adopt it so, you know, it's not lost. And one of the things that my sister did was that she would always buy socks, you know, like Christmas socks or Halloween socks or Valentine's Day socks, whatever. Yes, yeah. And, um, you know, give them to us for, you know, that holiday. And so when she died, you know, I said to myself, well, who's going to do that now? And I said, well, I'll do that now. I'll be the person in the family who buys the the socks. And um, and that's what I've I've done. And, you know, with some of my close girlfriends, I also give them socks. And I have one friend who says, oh, I'm so really looking forward to those socks. You know, know, because I'd leave it like, you know, on their door at work or whatever. I, I just was really waiting for that talk. <laughs> so, so you can, um, you know, as Anita is saying, is that you know you can find a way to honor your loved one, um, even by saying, well, what is it that they do, or what is, what was it that they bring, and let me do that since they're not here to do that. What do you think? Right, you think right, about Anita. I was going to say I love it because I think about a lot of people that do that, actually. You know, let's say, uh, for instance, if if someone had a a child that they lost to cancer, they suddenly decide to go, or, you know, a husband, I I remember a couple of uh, stories where it it, it really promoted the idea, it it influenced the idea of creating an organization, uh, creating a nonprofit, uh, creating these fundraising opportunities to help cure the situation to help others experience uh, a, a better way. So, you know, it fosters growth. It fosters opportunities and it helps others also because you have people who are existing today that go through the same circumstances and there are folks who, when they lose someone they love due to that specific illness, by their involvement, getting involved in that specific cure for that illness, you know, it just drives so much opportunity to healing others. And even in that sense, when you do things in the memory of others, it, it is my belief, not everyone agrees with it, but it is my belief that they do live on, that they are fine and well. And all they are, you know, to, to be able to know that this is what they're able to see that's happening at, on earth now. Uh, I, I always tend to say, you know, in terms of my imagination and how it works, that if, if I were right now, here I am, their only child that's on this earth right now. This is the time I have. And at, as your wonderful organization shares about everybody, everyone dies. You know, this is my time every single day. Every, you know, we lose a little bit more every single day. So what am I going to make the best of, of this time? Well, on top of that, I think my parents gave me life. And if I spent every day of my life mourning and grieving and feeling sorrow and depression and limiting myself, then am I doing the service of being alive in the best of my ability because they gave me life? Shouldn't I, should I make the best of it and give them something to look at to be able to say, look at my kiddo go. Look at what she's doing. Would you look at her over there? She is just killing it. 
she is badass. I love what she's doing <laughs> versus, oh, my gosh, my poor daughter, she's crying every day. You know, I, I, well, I, I want her to stop crying. I want her to, I want her to grow. I, want her, I brought her in this world. She could do something. You know, I'm not here to help her. And, I, you know, I don't want my family, whether it's my grandparents, anyone that's passed, to be able to look at this and see me in that state of mind when all of them had one another in order for me to be here. So what can I do in the time that I'm given that I can give to the world on behalf of my family, on behalf of my parents? And not only that, I happen to have a daughter. What can I do to show her how to live your life even when others leave? What can I do to celebrate it? So I can keep moving forward. And my daughter's picking up on that. You know, she, she can embrace people living and she could really hold gratitude when that person's no longer there. And I think that's really important for all of us, especially in this year. There's a lot of emotion that is, uh, let's just say the emotional intelligence is kind of plummeted with the number of things that we're hearing all around us that if we keep our direction in looking at lack we're going to not see where all the opportunity is because it naturally mm-hmm. limits us. And I really want to break those limits from people's mind. It, they all have the ability to break down that limiting wall and see what their, their future holds. And I believe anyone that has had a loss in their life, while they should grieve, once they're done, I want to see them feel inspired and hold gratitude and move forward celebrating that they actually had a life with someone so special. And the other piece of it, too, that I, I, that I think is important is that with any kind of change or growth, we're going to, if you, you know, for lack of a better term, sort of backslide a little. We can do what you're talking about, but there's still going to be moments where, um, you know, maybe you see that heart or you hear that song or whatever it is that you associate with that person that, that that sadness comes back. And it's not because you're, you know, like, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we don't ever stop grieving and we don't ever stop right. missing that person. So there are going to be right. times where, you know, that, that hole in your heart is going to feel huge. Yep. I, saw this, right. I saw this meme. I think oh, maybe my daughter sent it to me. And it, it, I think it was on Instagram or something. And the way the girl described grief, I don't know if you saw this, she said, you know, imagine a box, and in the box there's a button that, you know, when it presses it, you know, it makes noise, it goes off. And when the per- person first dies, and there's a balloon in the box. So when the person first dies, the balloon is huge. It takes up the whole box. So it's constantly pressing on that button, constantly setting things off. Over time the balloon starts to shrink and it bounces around in that box and it still hits the button and you know as time goes on and the balloon is shrinking it's going to hit the button less frequently but the balloon never goes away it's even though it's small it's still bouncing around in that box and it's Mm -hmm. still going to hit the button sometimes that's great. I no, I never, I never heard of that. I love it. I think it's and it's accurate. It's true. Very uh, accurate, right? Yeah. I mean, I here I am. On it's our our like, web page for those of you people who aren't on Facebook with us. But I thought that's a perfect way, you know, because people want it to stop. They want it to stop hurting, and I can appreciate that. But but we need to have some management of expectations in that there are going to be times when that ball hits that that button that we are going to still feel so sad right and you know I think I think that that's I I understand that really well and even still my, my mom passed in 2005 it's 2020 and even still as I as I mentioned earlier you know writing the book reading the book you know the illustrations everything uh, I did cry I had many moments where I, the tears just fell out of my eyes. It's not the same kind of uh, weep that you go through in the beginning of, of grief, but it's absolutely still filled with the same kind of love because you mm-hmm. have it and you celebrate it. But sometimes, you know, grieving 
it's so necessary. You know, sadness has a message. Your tears hold messages. And that's why, you know, I, what I see happening a lot when it comes to negative feelings and especially sad feelings, that I feel that um, at least the culture that we see here in our lives for a long time, it's changing over, over the so, past, seven, I would say, 10 years or so, but it's not quite there yet. That when you're sad, you can't process it. You know, you almost feel wrong for processing it. You know, I, I know it all the time. I see it with moms all the time, and even especially for, for, for men. Uh, so when it comes down to the moment that you feel sad, you, you notice that the tears start coming, and suddenly you're looking for the handkerchief or, you know, the tissue, mm-hmm. and you're, you're, you're blotting your eyes. Or, oh, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. You know, nobody wants to see anyone cry. No one wants to show the ugly cry. We all want to just kind of, like, get past that and be happy all the time. And I, I really believe that, of course, I do understand where they're coming from. But if you can find a place in a, in, a, in a time, you know, sometimes you're in a car and you feel like crying, you know, hopefully no one's looking and you're not worrying about it. Just let it go. Let the tears fall. Feel it, you know. Um, if you're in a place where you feel really, really emotional and you need to be in a safe place, go to the safe place. But be emotional. We can do this with our laughter all day long. We laugh until it hurts and our face hurts and we have tears coming out and we have to have that last, last sigh, right? We do that so well. <laughs> but with our grieving, you know, it's almost like the leaky faucet. Like there's so much and yet we're only giving a little bit, only giving a little bit. And I know that feeling because I, I live that life. Of, of being afraid to cry, being afraid, or feeling uncomfortable. And um, still there's moments of that because you think of society. We don't just bawl in front of people. But um, when you know that you're crying, when you know that you feel sad, you should take those moments and write. You know, in my opinion, I say you should, you know, if, you, if you're a journal person, then write with your handwriting into the journal and write a letter to the person you're crying about. If it's God that you want to write to, then go for that. If it's the person, like I've written to my mother. I've gone and found cards for my mother. I've created a little box, a memory box, and I just put it in there. It's, just, it's a little mailbox that she gets to read on her own. Um, I found ways to be able to grieve graciously for my mother and the loss mm-hmm. of her, but also because I'm cherishing that I had her. And it, those memories are so great. So what else can I do? So I guess I could go ahead and write an illustrated book so I could share how much I celebrate my mother to everybody else. And then they can relate to it. And then they can have some good times. So, you know, there's all sorts of ways that we can hug the love that we had and, and honor it. But you are absolutely right. Grieving won't really stop. You're going to get those, those pit stop moments. And when you have them, you should have them. You should allow for them. And be around, if you can, be around friends who will allow you, who will sit with you and just, you know, not tell you to not cry or don't cry. It's going to be okay. Uh, I think the dialogue needs to change where we just let them cry and say it's okay. It's normal. Like, just to tell people it's normal. Can we just, I mean... Isn't that what we want? We all want to be normal. I mean, some of us yeah, will never yeah. be, but you know, we all want to be normal. Yeah, and, it, and it, it takes a little training for those of us that have to sit next to someone who's weeping because we're not used to it. We haven't been right. groomed to doing this. So even, you know, in a funny way, if I, you know, I have to tell my husband when I'm in those those cheerful moments, I'm like, just sit next to me. He's like, just don't say anything, okay? You know, and he's just like, okay, I'll just, um... Do you want a tissue? you want a team? No, 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 no. You know, so, you know, we have to help the people that we're with talk to our family and say, hey, if I feel sad, if you don't mind just letting me have this moment or, mm-hmm. I, I, you know, just prepare them so that they know. They don't feel like I don't even know what to do with this moment. I'm not prepared. I'm not, I'm not trained. So lots of, lots of different ways that we can go about it. But I do feel that having a book like Hearts to Matter I think should be in everyone's bookshelf, even if it is considered a kid's book. Uh, just look at it like if you are someone who loves Dr. Seuss and you're an adult, then you should get a book like this because it does send a nice message across. Um, I also make it fun for the children where uh, the illustrator and I work together where there's hidden hearts throughout the book. Yes, there are obvious hearts there, but we've hidden quite a few in there, so we hope that they can try to find it. Uh, and also we gave them a little contest to see if anyone could – I shouldn't call it a contest. It's just more of a fun exercise. If they can find the hearts uh, and they send me, uh, there's an email that we provide, an email address, and we can go ahead and um, I'll, I'll send them something to them to congratulate them for finding the number of hearts that are actually in the book. Oh, that's um, very clever. 
Yeah, I wanted to make it fun for them too. It it wanted to be fun. And then um, I I was mentioning earlier, halfway through me writing this book, I decided to make this journal. The journal that I created is – it's called Grateful Celebrations, as we, as we just mentioned. And all it is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a purse size book. It's a small book. It could fit in your purse or bag, you know, man bag for men out there. Uh, this is a book where I wanted to make it interactive for you, where you could remember the good things, uh, where you could jot down information, where you could write a letter to, to for a, kind of like look at it as journal prompts that help you get through some of these hardships that you go through when you have loss. And what you write down are things that are good, things that are wonderful, things that are the things that make you smile about the person so you can hold gratitude and you can keep celebrating. And then when you're done and you finished it up, you have a beautiful memorial of a, of a sweet book that you can keep handy. You can get another one and uh, do it for someone else that might mean, mean something to you. And I would love to hear from anyone that does this. The first 50 people that actually complete this uh, gratitude journal that I have provided, it's a companion journal. It does go with the book. It actually asks questions that relate to the book. So you want both. Um, but mm-hmm. I have... Uh, I have a little gift for those who actually finish it and can provide to me uh, their feedback. How did it make them feel after doing it, after completing it all? What feelings did they go through? I'm so curious to know the feedback from anyone that fulfills the the journal. And uh, I have a little a gift for them that I'll be sending. Oh, that sounds wonderful. So the book is called Hearts Do Matter. You yeah. can order it on Amazon. And Anita Myers is the author, and I'm so pleased that you um, spent some time this afternoon talking with me. Thank you, Anita. Thank you. You're wonderful. Thank you so much for considering my time to come on here. You've been such a great person to talk to in so many ways, and I look forward to talking to you again and and everyone else that's listening. uh, Thank you all for your ears, and I hope that you enjoyed what you heard. Thank you, and um, I think we're going to need to have uh, Anita back to uh, teach us a little bit more about the um, emotional intelligence because I think that that would be real interesting for us too. So Anita, I hope that you're going to be willing and we can schedule that at some point. You got it. I am on it. I'm on it. Oh, thank you. Please stay tuned for the unending escapades of Everyone Dies, and thank you for listening. This is Charlie Navarrete. Sharing the determination of Groucho Marx, I intend to live forever or die trying. <laughs> and I'm Marianne Matzo, and we'll see you next week. Remember, hearts do matter, and every day is a gift. This podcast does not provide medical advice. All discussion on this podcast, such as treatments, dosages, outcomes, charts, patient profiles, advice, messages, and any other discussion are for informational purposes only and are not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Always seek the advice of your primary care practitioner or other qualified health providers with any questions that you may have regarding your health. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard from this podcast. If you think you may have a medical emergency, call your doctor or 911 immediately. Everyone Dies does not recommend or endorse any specific tests, practitioners, products, procedures, opinions, or other information that may be mentioned in this podcast. Reliance on any information provided in this podcast by persons appearing on this podcast at the invitation of Everyone Dies or by other members is solely at your own risk.